Anyway, um, the role of angels. I think some of the questions, do I have the questions this week up here? I don't think I do, do I? Oh, I don't. Um, I'm sorry about that. The, the Ask the Pastor series, there's a bunch of questions we've gone through so far. Uh, people keep pointing at the screen. They're not there. Um, and a couple of the, the two of the questions we're going to deal with today, one, somebody asked about generational curses. Um, are generational curses real? The second one is about angels and demons. <clears throat> well, I have some perspective on angels from culture here. Let's take a look at some pictures. Um, kind of that's what everybody thinks of, a muscular male-looking, uh, very dominant uh, figure, angel with wings. Let's go to the next one here. Uh, sometimes female. Angels are beautiful, so they're female. The Bible says they're neither male nor female, so that's interesting. Uh, this is kind of, you know, from uh, folklore and some of the imagery we have today. We have a lot of imagery in our culture today about uh, angels and in uh, a lot of art and modern-day uh, role-playing games, angels and demons. Uh, of course, there's Touched by an Angel. <laughs> How many like that show? That was a good show, right? I mean, come on. It was clean, anyway. Uh, so, what else we got? Touched by an Angel. That one was, uh, what was that show? Highway to Heaven, that's what that, I had the wrong, I had the wrong name, Touched by an Angel, okay, how many saw this show, yeah. we like that show, okay, uh, well, I think I've got some more, uh, Drag Me to Hell, popular of a, a, a na name of a movie that was come out a couple years ago, so a fascination with the demonic and, and devils and whatnot, do I have one more, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff contemporaneously in culture about demons and angels and, and battles about lots of TV shows these days, about demonology and, and things about demons and demon possession and whatnot. And I think that's all I have. Um, oh, oh, yeah, this is where we start. So, so what is the role of angels today? What about demons? What about generational curses? And we're going to deal with all of these things. And I have an exhaustive outline on your paper. There's two sides. Uh, there's very little fill in the blanks, but a lot of it is just for your reference material so you can study at home if you're interested to know more about these ideas and things. But... The Bible tells us, I want to use Hebrews 1.14 to springboard us into this great adventure this morning. Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? And the word in the Hebrew, um, malak, means angels. In Greek, angelos, meaning messenger. Both of them mean sent from God, messengers from God. And described as God's messengers and servants before the creation even began. Way back in Job chapter 38. So angels were created. They were created by God. Um, they were created good and, and holy, but with a freedom of choice. When God created them at Satan's rebellion, many remained faithful to God. The Bible tells us that two-thirds of heaven remained faithful to the call of God, to his uh, voice and the things that his will, and a third of heaven was cast out um, in, into the earth that followed uh, Lucifer and his desire to overtake the throne of God. Uh, we get the, all of this picture kind of revealed to us in Job and, and the prophets, but many identify demons of the New Testament with these fallen angels, and we can because Jesus actually did. In the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord appeared many times, and um, they are, though many times they are thought to be what's theologically called a theophany, which is an Old Testament appearance of Christ. For example, the angel comes to talk to Abraham and tells him that he's going to, you know, his wife's going to conceive, and she's in her tent laughing. There's also the angel that stood. Um, before Gideon with a flaming sword. And these are the ones that send words from God, and, and we can picture them being from Jesus himself, the Son of God. So uh, there's, there's a handful of times in Scripture in the Old Testament where we see these theophanies where Jesus actually appeared to people. And so, but angels are created beings. Jesus is eternal God, uh, God himself. So it's a little bit different. So the angel of the Lord title um, is... is is when they use angel of the Lord, it's believed to be Jesus, and just angels are just angels. So, um, so an academic exercise, who are the angels? Let's, let's use the Bible, since folklore and everything else comes from the idea, from, from ideas that are perpetuated from Scripture, we're going to use Scripture to look at angels and their qualities and characteristics. 
um, the good ones for now. Let's stick on the good side, okay? The good angels are spirit beings. The Bible says there are a lot of them. They worship God. They do his will. They see his face. They are obedient to Christ. They have abilities that people do not. They have different ranks and functions according to scripture. They did not. They do not marry. Uh, they are immortal. They are, not they are not to be worshiped like God is. So what are the roles of angels today? A lot, a lot of the angels' roles um, mentioned in scripture are related to Christ's work and to salvation. And it's very important that we understand that, that the salvation that has come through Jesus to mankind, because we've all sinned and we, ha we can't save ourselves, we, we have no way to redeem ourselves and, and find hope for salvation at all, that is only through Jesus and his, sub his work on the cross, that he gave his life for us. And all of the work in the New Testament as it relates to angels, especially talks about their work in response to and in duty of that message of salvation that Jesus carried out through his life, death, burial, and resurrection. So the Bible says many things about him, and again, these are on your outline. You can research them. I put scriptures with each one to, to reiterate the point there. They rejoice over one sinner who repents. Can you imagine that? All of heaven rejoicing over one person that comes to know Christ. It's a celebration of sorts. They care for God's people. They give direction. They appear in dreams. They can appear in human form. Uh, they protect saints who fear God and hate evil. They bring answers to prayer. They strengthen people in trials. They wage war against the demonic. They carry the saved to heaven. They observe the church on the earth. All of these things are very important roles of angels, but we don't pray to angels. Angels aren't to be worshipped or prayed to, just like dead saints aren't supposed to be prayed to or worshipped. The Bible says have no communication with the dead. And, and so we pray to the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave his life for us and died on a cross and rose again. So during the end time, angels have a, a very specific role. There's a war between Michael and, and the holy angels, the Bible says, and Satan and his demonic hosts, and it will intensify. If you go online, you can look at... Um, in our past sermon log, and you can look at the Revelation series where it talks about this great war that happens in the heavens, the Bible says. And there'll be the, the demonic is defeated firmly and soundly. The holy angels will come with Jesus when he returns. The Bible says they will be present at the judgment of the entire human race. So scripture has a lot to say about good angels and what they do today in our lives. And scripture also relays that there is this idea of a guardian angel that God sends to every person. This is great. This means that, that you and I, friends, have an angel on assignment in our lives right here with us. Scripture says that those living for Christ kind of have this protective buff angel in the spirit world watching over them, fighting uh, what we can't see, but we know that they are there. So all of this is important, I think, and it's all necessary because we're in a fight. We're in a spiritual fight. And the conversation this morning is much more about spiritual warfare maybe than it is specifically about angels and demons. Um, hopefully all of those qualities we mentioned through those myriad of statements and scriptures answers a lot of questions about angels and, and their purpose for us here on earth. But we're in a spiritual fight. And, and in this world, especially in America, in the world today, especially has denied the creator and are worshiping created things and um, created ideologies. And the enemy wants to instill doubt in the, in the power of God. He wants to destroy the servants of God. He wants to destroy you, friends. He wants to, he's knocking on your family's door. He's after your marriage. He's after your children. He is after your life. He is out to get you. Don't think for one minute that you are not in a spiritual battle. All the things that manifest themselves in the physical that are happening in your life, there's, there's a spiritual battle going on behind every single thing. And we, have, we as believers have to be aware of that, that we have more responsibility on our knees than anywhere else. I think we've gotten a lot better on our feet than we are on our knees. And we need to get better on our knees and calling on the Lord and saying, God, you know, I, I need you desperately. We always act like we're on our feet. We, we gain our balance. We go in our own strength. And God's saying, wait, I want you to stop a minute. I want you to trust in me. I, I need you to trust in me. I need you to rely on me. And, and that's, of course, where prayer comes in and seeking him uh, consistently every day. It's because the, in, the enemy is out for blood. He's out to get you. And this is where we get into the fallen angels, un, Satan's unholy fighting force, if you will. Anytime you bring up the demonic or some stuff like this, 
this kind of subject raises a general variety of reactions. And I want to mention five different things, six different things that are kind of happen when people talk about the demonic or demons. Number one, they dismiss stories about demons altogether. And we're a civilized Christian, you know, now we're, we're grown up, we're, we're more mature in a, our ways of understanding and to make it a myth or relevant to contemporary life. This is primitive. We don't have to deal with this anymore. We think that we're smarter than previous generations. So uh, because we're more technologically advanced that, that somehow we have outgrown the idea of the demonic and it no longer affects us. That's the first reaction. Secondly, to reinterpret stories about demons. Yeah, it's an old story. Maybe it was a psychological, mental health issue and sort of a naturalistic approach to demons and, and the demonic. And it's an old story and never, never giving any credence to anything really spiritual. Thirdly, there are those that accept the stories as they really happen, but what happened in the scriptures as far as Jesus dealing with the demonic and all of those things, they aren't for today. That it happened a long time ago in the first century, and it, now we're smarter now. We've outsmarted the demons and the demonic, and we're more advanced today. We don't deal with depression anymore. We don't deal with sadness or sorrow. We don't deal with uh, hurt and anxiety. We don't deal with, the, with pain that comes from the loss of a loved one. We don't deal with all the, the things in life. We, we don't deal with stuff anymore like we used to. So the demonic really isn't. We're, we're never tempted by Satan these days. So we don't need to worry about the demonic in the spiritual realm. Still, fourthly, there are those who have over-rationalized it because our only education about demons comes from television and movies. We think about the demonic in, in the realm of the, the exorcist that we saw way back in the 70s, you know, in the 80s, the, the image of the exorcist with dolls that come to life and kill people, and Chucky or whatever, and, and Christine, the demon-possessed car. How many remember Christine? And um, toys that attack. And, of course, now we have, we're much more clever. We've got these television shows that... that uh, popularize vampires and demons and devils and werewolves and, and they kind of all tied into this same idea of, of the demonic. And, and there's, there's good demons now. As you watch TV, uh, there's, there's, there's the good demons and there's the bad demons. And the good demons, that you, you can get them on your side, they'll fight the bad demons. And there's a witch hunter now that, that goes around with magic bullets. It's, it's a TV series that's coming out. And they have a, she has a bullet and she's called... Uh, I forgot what her name is. Anyway, she shoots the demons with her bullet gun, and it sends them straight to hell, you know. And, and so the demonic and the message of the demonic, kind of the story has changed, but nothing is really different than it always has been. The idea to capture, captivate the hearts and minds of an entire generation through movies and television about the demonic has happened. It's already happened. And people are fascinated by it. They, they love to go over to horror movies. And I saw a horror movie uh, many years ago when I was a kid and, and, and on a band tour. And, and we were on this band tour and these guys all went to this horror movie. And we had one person that was 17 and got us all in under her ID, right? And we went in to see this movie. And, and the whole time I'm watching, everybody's like frightened and scared. I'm laughing through the whole movie because they, they were trivializing it because I was a believer. And I was thinking, this is crazy. This is so funny, you know? I mean, it was gross, but it was funny to me. And I laughed at it because they tried to make the demonized thing seem so real. They have no idea about this real spiritual battle that every single believer understands. Because when we're on our knees and we're fighting for our lives, we're fighting for our marriages, we're fighting for the things that come against us in this life, we are fighting in the spirit realm and we are sensitive to that. And we know that and we understand. These days all these things should really trouble us because they, they've oversimplified the idea of demonology and demons and devils. So on the other side, and fifthly, number five, some react to it with reasoning that if we bring a lot of attention to it, we're going to give ourselves an unbalanced approach to our spirituality and, and turn real faith into, uh, in God into a circus show. And I've seen people do this. I've seen preachers on television do this. They turn the message of the gospel into a circus show because they overemphasize the demonic. On the other side, there are those that want to take this sensational approach and have an unhealthy appetite to cast demons out of doorknobs. I've heard theology like this. 
that there is a certain devil way up in the ice cap somewhere, and you go and you climb on the mountain, and these guys actually went out, and they got a team together, they went out and climbed up this mountain in these ice caves, and they're way up, and the demon is in this ice cave, and this, so they went up there, and they laid their hands on the uh, certain icicle that was in the ice, and they cast the devil out of it, so it would quit troubling them any longer. There's all kinds of ideologies out there, and, and, and this, this spiritual warfare is, is it, it oversimplifies it. It makes it into a sideshow. It makes it into a circus joke. And, and people have, that have an unhealthy appetite uh, for, to you know, give demons too much, we give demons too much credit because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. When you think of spiritual warfare, though, what do you think of? I think many believe that it's actually a specialized form of ministry, like exorcism and deliverance ministry. You have to say so many Hail Marys, hold a crucifix in your hand, have your prayer beads, and, and, or certain types of intercess, intercession, and we seek out the super evangelist pastor who's blasted all over TV and radio, and we're going to go see him because he can cast a demon out of our life, or the, the, the spiritual guru who lives in a cave and, and preaches in hotels in their conference rooms uh, every Sunday afternoon so he can pull all the people from churches that are faithful in serving God. And there's a certain amount of antics and performance in these people, and yeah, I am trivializing them because I think they're a joke. Because let me tell you something, friends. You don't need some spiritual, super spiritual spirit guru to put his hand on you and cast the devil out because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Jesus said, come unto me all you who are weary and heavy burden and I will give you rest. It's not so much it's in our generation. I think we've lost the idea of calling on God, just spending time on our knees before God and, and waiting on God until he really touches us. We think that there's a shortcut if we go to see the super evangelist guru guy. And it's just not the case. Now, I believe that God gives gifts to those that are in ministry out there, gifts of healing and certain things, and they're, they're, I believe they're important for the church. But friends, if we were to pray and ask God and trust his word, he never goes back on his word. We're following Jesus, and in this world, we're going to have real enemies. The human race contains all kinds of issues, violence and bitterness and poverty and crime and terrorism and duplicity in the church and betrayal and brokenness. How do we quantify all the evil in the world if we don't understand that there is a demonic force at work? There's a tremendous picture of spiritual warfare and the struggle in the New Testament. And I want to just go through this. Luke 11 says the strong man or Satan is fully armed and someone stronger. Jesus conquers, quote, the strong man and takes his armor. Matthew 10 said Jesus came to bring the sword to the spiritual realm. Luke 4, 18, Jesus came to bring liberty to the captives. Mark, 5, Mark chapter 5, the demonized man had, the Bible says, a legion of evil spirits. Colossians chapter 2, Jesus led the evil powers in a triumphal procession. Jesus took captive captivity captive and, and, and brought them out in victory. Colossians chapter 1 and 2 and, and 1 Timothy 4 talk about the Christian life is a spiritual struggle. The Christian life is a struggle against evil forces. Ephesians 6, 12, Hebrews 12. The Christian life is a struggle against sin. 1 Peter 2, verse 11. The desires of the flesh wage war against the soul. Jude chapter 3, Jude 3, Christians are called to struggle for faith. Philippians 1, Paul struggled for the gospel. Uh, 2 Timothy 4, Paul fought the good fight of faith in the spirit. Philippians chapter 2, Philemon 2, and, and 2 Timothy chapter 2, Christians, the Bible calls us soldiers, spiritual soldiers, spiritual warfare. Um, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, again, Christians need to wear spiritual armor. 1 Timothy 1, 6, and 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Christians engage in the warfare. Romans 6, 13, and chapter 13, and 2 Corinthians 6, a Christians wield weapons of warfare. Revelation 12 says, and there's an angelic war in heaven. And Revelation 19 says the beasts and the kings of the earth will make war. In Revelation chapter 20 and verse 8, Satan gathers all the nations for one final battle. And I like Revelation 20:10. He took the devil and his angels and cast them to the lake of fire. Woo! Yeah. So the Bible talks a lot about this spiritual war. That's just the New Testament in, in general. Everywhere you look in the New Testament, we are in a spiritual fight. We are spiritual beings, and we ought to be engaged in prayer daily in this spiritual battle. This is not something just to be fought on Sundays. You need it Monday before you get up and put the keys in your car to go to work. You really need it then. 
You really need it when there's no coffee and your wife left the drawer and the dresser open. You stubbed your way out and you're yelling at the kids and you go out with egg on your face. And you, you get to work and they say, wipe your face off. And you, everybody's got trouble with you that day. It happens. It's not that just life is tough because that it is. I mean, there are real struggles beyond stubbing your toe in the dresser that real people are hurting. They don't know about next week's paycheck. They're, they're, they're worried about this and that, and life has is, is, is come on them. And We need Jesus every day. We need his Holy Spirit to give us strength for our work and our school and all of these things. So demonic forces are at work, yes. Does the Bible talk about them? Yes. Christians are in, the, are, are, are in this battle not because Christians can be demon-possessed. They cannot but because we can be influenced and terrorized by the demonic. We are in a fight. In fact, very rarely do we find the concept of Scripture of demon possession in the Bible. We rather find the idea of demonizing and the work of demons to illustrate fear, to, to run interference in the lives away from Jesus. And can Christians be troubled or tempted and bothered by demon influences? Yes. Can they be possessed by Satan? No. You already gave up that space to Jesus. He possesses you. You can be troubled. The Bible talks about that, the oppression that the enemy can bring, and he does. He'll bring it to our life, and he'll bring discouragement. Oh, man, the demonic is at work. He's trying to get you. I remember one guy said, uh, a gal, actually, she came to me, Pastor, man, the devil's really been after me this week. Oh, Satan, he's been really kicking my tail, and uh, it's been really rough. I said, really? Wow, you must be a spiritual giant for the single present, non-omnipresent Satan to bother you. Because he can only be one place at a time. He has all of his demon cohorts to help him with the rest. You must be some super spiritual Billy Graham or something in our culture that, that he has specifically come right after you because you're so important. I think the closer that we get to God the more the enemy's going to come after us. But praise God, the greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. You see, this is the fight that we're all facing. These are the struggles that we all have. Christians can be troubled. They can be bothered by demon influences. And, and can people really use the excuse that the devil made me do it? No! In fact, 90% of spiritual battles are because our own flesh is fighting against the spirit. Paul talks about the struggle. He says, it wasn't the demonic. My own flesh did it. You heard me tell the story about the youth group I had, and I passed around this box and told them I had captured their greatest enemy in the whole world. And They each went around and looked in the box, and in the bottom of the box there was a mirror in it. <laughs> and he said, hey, you know, this is your greatest enemy. And they, well, I get that now. Yeah, me, myself, and I, the unholy trinity. There was a, Pam and I were youth pastors in Oregon, and it's to show that the influence of the demonic is very real. And we were in a place that was dark. And there was a lot of, the kids were into all kinds of Wicca and all kinds of uh, demon experiential things. And, and we um, had experienced some stuff with them in their homes that they showed us what they were doing. And there's pentagrams and there's satanic, there was a satanic cult just out of town. And it was an interesting place, and it was really toward the, the end of the real focus on um, Satanism. I forgot the Christian evangelist. It's a, he got converted. He was a comedian. Um, but then he, the whole thing turned out that actually he wasn't in the church. He had lied about the whole thing. And so I, 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 that whole time was really interesting, and we were in this place, and, and we were laying in our bed. And we were just laying in our bed. We were laying there, getting ready to go to sleep. And, and all of a sudden, we just felt this heaviness come in the room. And, and we were laying there, and our eyes were closed, and we said, Pam said, I'm afraid to open my eyes. And I said, well, well, let's pray. And the next day, we talked to an elder minister who was in the church, and we explained to him the situation, and he told us, you just need to take authority in Jesus' name. And we did that, and we didn't suffer anymore. I believe that Christians can be affected. I believe that they can be troubled. They can be demonized. That was an overt, obvious thing, but I believe that there are other things. I had a, a lady come to me and tell me weird things are happening in their house, and this was years ago. <laughs> I'm like, who am I to judge what's going on with you? I really don't know. Let's pray. I'm not saying that they can affect the physical world in a certain way, but the Bible does say 
that, they inter that we entertain angels. Hebrews 13, 2. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing you have unwittingly entertained angels. Well, let's take a biblical foundation for the topic of this. The spiritual battle that we're in. In a few scriptures, John 14, 30. I will not speak with, it, with you much longer for, quote, the prince of the world is coming. He has, hold, he has no hold on me, Ephesians 2.2, 2, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, talking about the demonic, talking about Satan, the spirit who is at now work and those who are disobedient, 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. The God of this age, he calls him, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they, they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of God who is the image of God, the God of this age. Ephesians 6.12 tells us about the struggle as well, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, and against powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. 1 John 5.19, we know that we're children of God, and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. You see, we're, like the Bible says, we're foreigners, we're strangers in this, we're aliens here. Like that old Petra song, we are strangers, we are aliens. Anybody know that song besides me? It's a great song! I'm the only one who knows it. Oh, Pam knows it. Oh, yeah, Anne Marie knows it. You're not of this world. Yeah, you know, yeah. Guess you had to go to the concert. Um, in America, over the last 200 years, we have advanced psychotherapy and medications to deal with demon like behavior. Today in America, we see it not only in the fringes of our culture, but if you were to sit with some of our missionaries and hear the stories they tell about the demon-possessed and, and strange, weird voices coming out of people and fits of rage and physical attacks, and we find that the practice of, of exorcism is very real. It wasn't that many years ago. Uh, my youth pastor and I at the time went to a man's house who was asked us to come over, and he changed his voice and physically attacked my youth pastor, threw him on the couch and jumped on, and I had to pull the guy off of him. And, and he was fighting and wrestling. I had to hold him still. And we began to pray in the authority in the name of Jesus. And we prayed and we called on God's name. And we, in Jesus' name, come out. In Jesus' name, come out. And he settled right down. Now later we learned that he, he moved away um, over here into one of the islands and he had committed suicide. And, and the sad part about it is that he had the answer. It's just like Jesus explained. He said, if you go into a house and you sweep it clean, it's clean. And then there's, the demon goes out and he finds more friends and he brings more back inside. And then all of a sudden that person's worse off than they were at the beginning. So when we, empty, when we emptied him out, he didn't take the opportunity to get himself filled up all the time. He didn't stick with Jesus. He ran from God and became once again involved with the world in the, in, in the world of drugs and homosexuality. And once again, he allowed himself to run from God and open his spirit up to all kinds of things. Behavior science has helped to see a variety of alternate explanations for outlandish behavior in our culture and altered states of consciousness. And specifically, when people think they're under the influence of a demonic spirit, but the Bible gives very real accounts of evil spirits, even gives examples of Jesus casting out demons on various occasions. Paul puts this in perspective for the believer in Ephesians 6 again. For our struggle, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of the heavenly realms. There's avenues of demonic affluence and, and how people can become de demonically influenced and how do you treat a real enemy that is out to get you. I'm reminded of a football game. We're coming up on football season. Are there any football fans here? There might be two or three Seahawk fans. I don't know. I'll pray for you. But anyway, I think that... What? I'll pray for the football fans. How's that? I pray that God would deliver them from that false god of worship every Sunday. Oh, uh, anyway. <laughs> I'm teasing, okay? All right, I'm teasing. All right, give me a little... It was a joke. I didn't mean to offend your God, really. Um, so... <laughs> it's a, I'm kidding, really. Man, this is serious. We ought to have to talk about football next week, maybe. A tough crowd, yeah. Well, when you want to, I'm reminded of a football team, or, or any team really, 
that has a coach, and the coach has a plan, a strategy of, uh, of how to win. So the first thing I think as Christians we have to do, we have to rely on our coach. You know, I don't think that he fights our battles for us. In fact, I know, because the Bible says Satan's already defeated. But we wrestle, I think, sometimes with these things in the presence of God. He doesn't, you know, we, we are called into this battle. We are called to the fight. So we need to listen to our, number two, I think we need to know some things about our enemy. I don't want to become overly dramatic with them or give them too much credit, but I want to know what their weaknesses are. And thirdly, I want to defend uh, myself and attack with extreme prejudice. I don't want them to win. I don't want them to have a chance. And it's important that we give each of these things equal attention and so that we don't have an unbalanced approach to it on any side. There are some things that people do. People blame the devil for doing all this stuff and never talking about the influence that they had in the world to allow the devil in. Number one, how do we do that? There are those that inv intentionally invite them into their presence, invite their presence into them. False religions, witchcraft, sorcery, channeling, all these things are still present today. They have a little bit different names, but they're still there. There's a magazine called Tarot Therapy. I don't know if anybody had ever heard it. I picked it up. I was at Barnes & Noble looking through. I was looking for Christian History Magazine. They don't print it anymore. And I came across Tarot Therapy among the Christian section. It helps people get past traditional psychology and focus on the, the spiritual ways to interpret the tarot card and all focused on meeting with someone to exchange transpersonal powers. As, as mentors for spiritual enlightenment. Fascination with angels and, and all this stuff was definitely predominant on the magazine cover. And werewolves, even yoga. And you might say, oh, Pastor, I do yoga. Well, for Christians, stretching is healthy, yeah, but did you know that the, that the yoga or the real uh, source by the theology behind it, really, is to open up your spirit. And, and that's a dangerous thing. We ought to be careful of things. There's books out there like Angels Within Us, Ask Your Angel of Angels. There's Guardians of Hope and the Angels of Mercy books. And all giving us on how to communicate with angels, open up to them and receive their energy. And this is all taught in these books, and it's nothing new. It's simply a new form of the ancient polytheism, which is, is an Indian religion is like this. American Indianism is the same way. Is that me? Um, Indian religion does the same thing. It, it, we're all connected to everything, the spirit world, we're the spirit eagle, the spirit wolf, and, and, and the dream that people hang from their mirrors is, is all symbolizing a similar thing, that we are, we are, we are uh, allowing ourselves to be connected with every living thing. That, that movie that came out years ago was very uh, Avatar. I don't know if you saw that Disney movie Avatar, but it talks about you know, the Indian philosophy, this religion is the same, that we're all connected by this spiritual source. And this polytheism is still present today. You can find on the web, there's instructions from the archangel Raphael instructing people on how to get in touch with angels. It says this quote, it's on the website, you can read it. To start with your, I think my battery's dying. I think that's what it is. Yeah, the light went out. Hopefully that'll, hopefully that'll work. But anyway, it says, to start working with your higher self-guides, and I'm quoting from this on, on, off the web, Sanandra, an archangel, or ascended master, all you need to do is invite them in. You do not need to know how to formally meditate or channel to do this. Just relax in a sitting or laying position and state your intention to work with them. As you become sensitive to your higher self's energy, you can set up a communication system with them. When you can feel their energy strongly, you can ask questions of them and get responses through their energy. That's how to do it. So there are those, I believe, in this world today that have become influenced, even possessed by, but definitely influenced, demonized by the enemy because they've intentionally invited their presence, not a Christian, Christians can be demonized but not possessed, but the idea that they have allowed them to come in that way. 
Number two, residual influence from the past. Allowing past sins to cast a shadow of guilt on us. And many have used the term generational curses. And we referenced uh, uh, Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5 and Deuteronomy chapter 5 and verse 9 as well. As we get to the Ten Commandments. And the first one is, um, you know, I'm the Lord your God, I have no other gospel. The second one is graven images. And I find it very interesting that along with the, the description of graven images and have no graven images among you, that, that God goes into this little blurb about um, the whole idea of, of the generational curses. That one generation, he will visit the sins of the fathers, so the generations that follow because of the sins of the father. And the graven image idea is really interesting because what do we keep in our homes from previous generations? What do we allow to come in? You know, one generation allows in moderation, the next will allow in excess. If, if we allowed a little bit uh, of, of alcohol, it could be that our kids could be alcoholics. I mean, there's all kinds of things that tie to the principles of scripture here that relate to this idea of generational curses. However, many places in the New Testament make salvation an individual responsibility. Mark chapter 16, verse 15, the Bible tells us in the Great Commission that the individual who believes is saved and the individual who believes is baptized, not because their father was or not because their mother was. Adults can't hear or believe for their children or other family members either. Our, my kids are not saved because I'm saved. They're saved because of the influence, I believe, of my salvation. Had a great influence in their life. But because I came to Christ, it doesn't automatically save them. Um, they... they if one being baptized does not believe, then baptism means nothing. It's the same is true. Salvation is one thing. Christians can be troubled as a result of past channeling, past witchcraft, sorcery, and other religious practices. But the good news is that Jesus breaks those bonds. The habits in your family, abuse from your father or mother, can build a life system that hinders clear thinking. We see many times, and, and those of, um, there's some parents that I know that their babies... Uh, have adopted babies that have been uh, children of those who were addicted to drugs. And they had a hard time initially, and, and there's a propensity, as, as studies show, and that child to have affinity for that if, if the parents aren't careful and, and lead them toward righteousness in a, in a different way of life. They can break the chain, is what I'm saying. But that means that the influence of the previous generation did a lot to influence the younger generation. Many like the healing needed in your life. If your father or grandfather was an alcoholic, you might have struggles with that. The Bible says that Abiah committed the sins that his father had done before him in 1 Kings 15. Nadab he says he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, walking the way that his father did in 1 Kings 15. Basha, the Bible says he did evil in the eyes of the Lord, walking in the ways of Jeroboam in his sin. Isaiah did evil in the eyes of the Lord because he walked in the ways of his father and mother and in the ways of Jeroboam, son of Nabat, 1 Kings 22. And I think it's important to recognize that, it's that for typical sinful patterns in a family to repeat themselves in following generations, that it can definitely be there. But the spiritual life of the parent and influences in our family can have a dramatic effect on breaking that chain. Did you hear what I said? That we have an effect on effect, we have a, a responsibility, we have an opportunity to affect the gen next generation to break that chain just because Christ lives in us. Because his spirit is alive and well. The spiritual life of our parents and influencers in our family can have a, a big impact on our life. And what one generation would allow spiritually, maybe it would grow in the next, and then it would grow into greatness. Evil spirits want to exploit families, sinful patterns, sexual sin, marital unfaithfulness. And, and this is where Jesus steps in. The Bible says he is the victor. He has the victory. The victory is already won. Friends, Christians don't need to pray for the victory. The victory is already won. I hear people say, I'm praying for the victory. You already have the victory in Christ. It's about us reaching out and believing his word and trusting his word and following him. This is where Jesus steps in. He says, I am the one. So I think that there are definitely residual influences from the past, but we break the chain. We break the chain. Number three, unintentionally inviting their presence. Habitual practices of sin. This is among the most appealing of the demonic influences because it works in cooperation with our flesh. When we continue to stay enslaved to habits that are contrary to Jesus, the worst thing happens that can possibly happen. We lose sensitivity about sin in that area of our life, 
and we lose the conviction of the Holy Spirit. We, we ignore it. Scripture says in Ephesians 4.27 that we're not supposed to give the devil a foothold. We're supposed to be careful. And when you're constantly engaged in sensuality and pornography and, and alcoholism or doubt or addiction or some very powerful thing is that work in your life and you're in danger, that thing is pulling you away from salvation. This little booklet we wrote, remember going through this, Spiritual Strongholds? We still have some out there in the foyer. You can take one and and uh, it talks about identifying the tormentors that come as a result of a spiritual life that's far from God. And it shows us how to break those chains. I don't want to get into it this morning, but it's, it's there available for you. The things that happen are damaging because we lose the desire for God's word, because the addiction has took, taken hold of us. We lose the desire to pray. We lose the desire to worship and serve God with his people. All this because we allowed that habitual sin to remain. When God says, I have come to take that from you. And I know there's many that have prayed many times, say, God, I, this thing, I just can't seem to break or get out of my life. Let me know, he hears your cry. Don't quit crying out to God. No matter how worried we get about something or how troubled we can become over the thing in our life. We need to know that we need to reach out. And we're not lone rangers. Friends, your church family can pray with you. Those that are close to you can pray for you. The lone ranger was always saved by Tonto. <laughs> he always went into town, got tied to a pole or something. Tonto, come and save the day. Or it was the opposite sometimes. Usually Tano's the one that went in and got all tied up and everything and they were going to kill him or whatever, hang him. And here comes the Lone Ranger. You can't do it on your own. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 12, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. Do you enjoy God things? Do they seem boring to you compared to the games or habits or entertainment? Do you avoid the ministry of God's word? Do you avoid reading his word? Do you, do you hide in the closet away from hearing what he's saying? Do you, do you turn off the radio of Christian teaching and turn on something else? And fourthly, there's special attacks against Christians. Deception, temptation, physical attack, as a special period of attack. Ephesians 6.13, the Bible says, So when the day of evil comes, what? Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand. Demonic opposition to carrying out the mission of the church, especially in sharing the gospel. The enemy does not want us to share the message and the hope there is in Jesus. I believe that there are so many that are suffering in this day and age uh, from all kinds of things in our lives, in, uh, in sins and things that hold us captive, all because we're not trusting in God to set us free from those things. We're not seeking him. We're not, we're not getting to know him. Spiritual warfare is a work for every Jesus follower, for everyone. You and I can't succeed on our own. We must draw on the strength that Jesus promised. Let's read that scripture in Ephesians chapter 6, 13. Therefore put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth, buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and you're with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to this, take up the shield of faith, which you can... Uh, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for the saints. Look at this. There's seven things. How we respond to the enemy that he puts in here. Number one, to practice honesty and live with moral integrity. I think this guards our life. Remember the scripture says, guard your heart with all diligence, for out of it come the issues of life. He says to to put on your pants. And it's no coincidence. We wear the truth. Put it on you. For we know that we're in Christ because the powers of darkness will do their best to deceive us. Secondly, he says, develop personal holiness and character, good character. Put on the breastplate of righteousness, he says. It's more than just right living. We know that we're not righteous on our own. We're made righteous through Christ. But that comes with the following Jesus and beginning to, to love what he loves and to hate what he hates and, and learning more, have an appetite for the things of God than the things that we love so much. Putting on that breastplate, realizing that our status before God is one who has been acquitted of all guilt. You don't have to fall in the train of guilt anymore. You're, you're not in that place anymore, friends. You are in the place of God's victory. Thirdly, he says, principally, he says this, prepare yourself for sharing the gospel wherever God calls you. Put on your boots. Share the good news. Tell others in your life. 
Somebody might be struggling with something in their, their life and they can share with you. You can identify because you're going through this thing, but you have the Lord on your side. Praise God for that. Number four, do not doubt. Take the shield of faith. Believe that God will help you to overcome. Number five, be secure in your identity in Christ, putting on the helmet of salvation. You are one who has been saved. You are united with Christ. You're made alive. You're, you're, co- you're co-resurrected. You're, you're, you're co-exalted. You are with Christ. He is, he is God. He is your King. He is, he is our Lord. He has saved us. And because of that, we are with Him. Our identity is in Him. Not in the failures we had yesterday, but we like to live there, don't we? Oh, I, this, I messed up here yesterday. I messed up there the day before. And all of a sudden, we've dumped on ourselves all of our failures, and we can't hardly move because we're remembering all of our failures. Number six, know the Scripture and apply it to every difficult situation. The sword of the Spirit, he says, which is the Word of God. Devote our lives aggressively to spreading the gospel, telling others, knowing the knowledge of the Lord, being involved with His Word, being grounded in your church. And I think the bottom line is always to pray. And be in prayer, because that is the realm, that takes us into the realm of spiritual warfare where we fight these things. This morning, I hope that we can understand that we're in a fight. And this fight is very real for our lives and something that we should never take lightly. 2 Peter reminds us of that in chapter 2, verse 4. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but sent them to hell, putting them in gloomy dungeons to be held for judgment. Thank you, Pastor. This is concluding on such a wonderful, encouraging note. (laughs) Verse 5. If he did not spare the ancient world when he brought the flood on ungodly people, but protected Noah, a preacher of righteousness, and seven others. If he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, bearing them in ash, and made them an example of what is going to happen to the what is going to happen to the ungodly, and if he rescued Lot, a righteous man who was distressed by the filthy lives of lawless men, for in that righteous man living among them day after day was tormented in his righteous soul by the lawless deeds that he saw and heard. If this is so, then the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials and to hold the unrighteous for the day of judgment while continuing their punishment. This is especially true for those who follow the corrupt desire of the sinful flesh and despise authority. But God knows how to deliver you. He knows how to set you free. He knows how to take the, the things that have demonized you and cause you such heartache and trouble in your life. And he is the one that brought deliverance through the cross. And he is for ever to be praised for that. I tell you, the things that we fight in the flesh, the struggles that we have in our life are not by accident, friends. I believe that the enemy is out to destroy us. I believe in the demonic, and I believe that we are in a real fight, and we all need to be prepared for this battle. I know this was really wordy. I know there was a lot of scriptures thrown out there. That's why you have such a hefty outline today. I know it was a little different. But my hope and prayer from this day is that we'll be able to take these things and we'll really engage in prayer, the Lord, and ask for his Holy Spirit to come and help us to overcome the things that have been troubling us in our lives. So let's pray about this and and we'll go have a great afternoon. Stand with me, would you? I'm just going to ask Pam if she will to come and play for us while we pray. Jesus, I thank you so much for your word this morning. I praise you, God, that you never fail. I thank you for these questions, God, that that point us in the direction of you. I praise you, God, that there are interests, Lord, and angels and, and, and uh, your healing and your power. I praise you, God, that we can learn more from your word about what's going on in the spiritual realm. And I pray for every believer that's in this place today. Lord, as we head toward our knees on Monday morning, as we're in our prayer closets throughout the week, as we spend time with you or driving in our car, I pray, Lord, that we would be engaged spiritually. Help us not to realize that the struggles we're facing in our marriages, the struggles we're facing in our workplace, the struggles we face in our families, the difficulties we find ourselves in, is because we live in a sinful world, a fallen world, and we need you, Lord Jesus, the victor, the one who gave us life. So I pray, Lord, on your people today, a very special blessing God, that as we go from here, we realize that greater is he that's in us than he that's in the world. We love you so much, Lord, and praise you for this day. Be honored in our lives as we walk in your victory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friends.